In this lecture, we shall explore Sidney's great defense of the divine origin and social utility of poetry, an apology for poetry. We shall discuss first how he praises poetry for being the cradle of civilization, for being a channel of divine power, for teaching and delighting, and for combining and surpassing the virtues of history and philosophy. We shall then move on to show how Sidney refutes the main arguments made against poetry. But first, a few words about Sidney, his age, and his essay. Sidney was not only a great poet and critic, but he was a man of the world. He lived during the great Elizabethan age. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare uh, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the 16th century. And we should remember that what we call the Elizabethan age is really the English Renaissance, right? It begins in Italy, and in, during the age of Elizabeth, the Renaissance makes it to England. And Sidney is very much a Renaissance figure. And what's interesting about him is, again, in addition to poet and critic, he was actually a soldier and a courtier a man of the world. And to me, this is important, because what better person to mount a defense of poetry? I'm glad that poetry wasn't defended by what we would call a wimpy guy living up in his garret. This is a man of the world. He knows what we call real politique. He knows what it is to live in the world, to fight uh, pragmatism. And so, again, we don't have a, uh, you know, a fluffy kind of man who has no strength. He is somebody who knows what it is to be in the battlefield, knows what it is to move in the court. And so he is realistic. And again, I think he was the perfect person to defend poetry. Now, Sidney saw it as his task to revive the sinking reputation of poetry. Again, as I told you in the first lecture, it is not just today that people have wondered if poetry is worthwhile. Poetry has always had its critics. And like all the critics, let me use a different word here, uh, now I'm talking about Sidney as a critic. Like all critics before him, Sidney knew that he would have to answer not only contemporary attacks on poetry, but the attack by Plato. In other words, Sidney knew not only must he answer what people were saying in the Renaissance, but you always have to answer Plato. He's always in the background. Remember I said he was the raison d'etre, the reason for being a theory? Plato was always there in the background. Now, one thing about his apology. Even though the apology is a brilliant work, it is more synthetic than original. In other words, most of the ideas that Sidney uh, conveys in his defense or apology is, has been said before by Horace, by Aristotle, by others. What Sidney brings to it is an incredible polish. His apology for poetry actually fits exactly a rhetorical strategy that people learn during that age. We don't learn rhetoric that much in school. Everybody did back then. And there are critics who love this that can actually outline Sidney's defense along, you know, exact lines, going back to Aristotle and Cicero and Horace. Now, again, everything that's here has been said before, but Sidney makes it more persuasive. But there's a difference now. Not only does Sidney have to answer the attacks of Plato, Sidney is very much a Christian critic. And so his defense of the moral nature of poetry must answer both Platonic philosophy and biblical theology. In other words, it's no longer just the Platonists who are saying poetry is immoral. There are a lot of Christians now who are saying poetry is immoral. That sounds strange since the Bible has a lot of poetry, but that's still with us. There are still many uh, Christians, often more conservative ones, that are a little bit suspicious of poetry. And so from this point on in the series, I'll be making a few more Christian references because almost all literary theory until the modern age has got to address Christianity in one way or another. And we could argue that literary theory from this point on and earlier is a mixture of the classical world and the Judeo-Christian world. So we're going to see more references from the Bible from this point on. All right, let's look at the four arguments that Sidney makes in defense of poetry. Again, this is very logical, systematic, like so many of the arguments we've seen in this series. His first argument in defense of poetry is that poetry is the light giver, the great cradle of civilization. As we saw with Horace, Sidney argues, I think almost more eloquently, if that's possible, that the poets are the first lawgivers, the first philosophers, and the first historians. You'll remember in an earlier lecture, I, rem I mentioned 
excuse me, the myth of Amphion, that he built the walls of Thebes by playing his pipe and the music uh, made the bricks move and form the uh, wall of Thebes? Well, this again is an idea that the poets are at the origin of civilization. They tamed the beast within. They established civilization. And this is a tactic that many defenders of poetry will use. This idea, again, that poets get everything started. And isn't that a wonderful play on Plato to say actually the first philosophers were poets. And actually early philosophy, what we call pre-Socratic philosophy, most of it was written in poetry. Isn't that interesting? Plato, of course, used prose, but early philosophy is written in poetry, like the wisdom literature of the Bible that we've mentioned before. Now, uh, along the line of this argument that poetry is the cradle of civilization, Sidney says, as many before have argued, that Plato himself was the greatest of poets. We've heard that before. This is insistent here. In fact, according to Sidney, Plato's fanciful dialogues and beautiful allegories are the skin of his philosophy. What he means by that metaphor is that uh, most of Plato's ideas are abstract. And the only way we can understand abstract ideas is if you give them a flesh or incarnate them, put them in the flesh. And what Sidney argues is that those allegories that I've mentioned before, the myths and allegories that populate the dialogues of Plato, that's sort of the body of his philosophy. That's how he literally embodies his ideas. We've heard this argument before, uh, but again, Sidney's not going to miss it. In a wonderful analogy, he compares poetry to a passport. In the same way that a passport gets us ready and allows us passage into a foreign culture, well, poetry prepares our mind to receive learning. And the wonderful thing is, if poetry hasn't sort of opened our mind and sharpened our thinking, then when we learn other disciplines from philosophy to science, they're not, quote, going to stick. So this is a wonderful idea that, again, poetry prepares our mind to receive other kinds of knowledge. This is part of this idea that poetry is the beginning. Everything builds on poetry. Indeed, Sidney says, men who attack poetry are like sons who rise up against their fathers. In the other words, the poets are the fathers of everything. And we're back to that phrase I gave you before, the anxiety of influence, this Oedipal need to kill off the father. Well, again, the reason people attack poetry is because they realize poetry is their father. The poets got everything started, and so they feel a little inadequate, if you will, in the presence of poetry. So they attack it. Particularly philosophers attack poetry. Let's look at his second reason, his second defense of poetry. According to Sidney, the power and craft of poetry are of the same essence as the divine. He argues that in antiquity, poets were seers and verse the language of prophecy. And we've mentioned before, and it's true, in the Bible, every time uh, there is a prophecy, it is written in prose. Now, I'm sorry, it's written in poetry. Now, there is a lot of prose history in the Bible, but whenever we get to prophecy, whenever we're, you know, uh, history just recounts what happened. Whenever there's prophecy, what do they say? Thus saith the Lord. So, in other words, in the Bible, somehow the closer you get to the divine, Suddenly we switch to poetry. Sidney realized that, and he realized that that's not just true for the Judeo-Christian uh, ethic or, bi or, or uh, prophecy, but it's true for pagan prophecy as well. When you get close to the divine, suddenly we start speaking in poetry. Indeed, he tells us that it is through poetry that King David in the Psalms was able to express and embody the majesty and the beauty of God. So not only is prophecy in poetry, but whenever we really want to praise God, whenever we want to capture his essence, his majesty, his power, suddenly we switch to poetry. And you know something? This is even true in the epistles of St. Paul. St. Paul is you know, so uh, uh, practical and systematic and he goes through his, 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 uh, um, his philosophy and his, uh, all of his ideas and his theology so systematically. But whenever Paul gets close to God, even he switches to poetry. Oh, the depth and the glory of God. He suddenly switches to poetry whenever he moves beyond ideas and gets to the reality of God. So again, in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, poetry is the language of the majesty of God. Heck, according to the Bible, the first thing said was a poem. What did Adam say? This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So the very first thing spoken by a man, according to the Bible, was a poem. Let's link this to some other idea, this divinity. According to Sidney, the poet is actually like God. 
Because both poets and God are makers. They make things, right? God created the world. He is a maker. And remember, he created the world out of language, according to the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. Now, whereas all other arts, from geometry to music to science, take their cue and their foundation from nature, the poet alone transcends and even improves upon the natural world. See, all the other disciplines are pretty much stuck with nature. They've got to take it as it is, we might say. But the poet, like God, creates things that are new. He maketh a new nature, Sidney says. And in that sense, again, poetry touches on the divine. That is to say, the mimesis, or imitation of the poet, is a higher kind of imitation. Poetry transforms beasts into cyclops, transforms men into heroes, transforms bronze into gold. It is poetry, rather than philosophy, that brings back or remakes the golden age. Poetry maketh everything new. Again, you can see that Sidney has a very high opinion of poetry. Finally, in this defense here of the divinity of poetry, he argues that what the poet finally imitates is not nature herself, but a more perfect idea in the mind to which the poet gives a shape or form. You'll remember the difference between Plato's low view of mimesis and Aristotle's high view? This is closer to Aristotle. The idea is that when a poet imitates, he doesn't imitate an imitation, but he imitates the essence of things. However, I would argue that in this argument, Sidney is not so much devoted to Aristotle as to a famous Neoplatonic philosopher named Plotinus. Plotinus was a new Platonist, and he strongly influenced St. Augustine. He was coming from a pagan tradition, but he influenced Augustine. And what Plotinus did is he took the ideas of Plato and sort of mix them together with the ideas of Aristotle. In other words, what Plato did, I'm sorry, what Plotinus did, is he accepted the world of being, world of becoming dichotomy of Plato, but to that he added an aristocratic idea that poetry goes for the idea rather than for the imitation. And Sidney is working in that tradition. The third defense is that the end of poetry is to teach and please. We've heard that before. Sidney says if that's true, then it must be useful to society, right? If poetry really teaches and pleases, what better function can it serve than to teach and please? In fact, he says that the imitations of poetry are able to delight and teach because they do not merely copy virtues and vices as they are, but as they should be. Remember we said before, all the other disciplines are stuck with the world as it is. Poetry can change things. And so when poetry talks about vice and virtue, it can talk about what we might call the form of vice and the form of virtue. You see, in our world, think about the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and of evil, which Adam and Eve ate of. That says that good and bad is all mixed together. Vice and virtue is all mixed together. Well, in poetry, because poetry can change things to the way they should be, poetry can give us a perfect example of vice and a perfect example of virtue. Why is that important? Because what happens is poetry is able to inspire the soul both to scorn the vices of its villains and to imitate the noble and virtuous actions of its heroes. In other words, it can prevent, uh, present us with such perfect examples of vice and virtue that it impels us as reader to follow virtue and forsake vice. And you know what? It does it better than philosophy. Why? Because philosophy, Sidney says, is too grave and austere to bring delight. It leaves the soul cold and indifferent. Again, there's something cold about philosophy, and it's too cold to inspire us to action. Philosophy can explain good and bad, but it's too cold to impel us to seek the good and forsake the bad. Poetry, which is, quote, hot, and it entertains us, and it's full of passion, inspires us not just to contemplate virtue and vice, but to live out the virtue and shun the vice. Finally, a fourth defense of poetry. And this you'll recognize from Aristotle. Sidney claims that poetry unites the universal truth or abstract precept of philosophy with the concrete example or physical act 
of history. You'll remember that Aristotle told us that, that poetry is basically history plus philosophy. It has all the particular concreteness of history mixed with the universal abstractness of philosophy. You bring them together. You may remember the phrase concrete universal I used. Sidney agrees with the idea that poetry is a concrete universal. And as such, he says, it has the power to implant itself in our memory and judgment. Think about Aesop's fables and Jesus's parables. One of the reasons people never forget those is because they are an abstract truth embodied in a nice, memorable form. And in fact, poetry wants to be memorized. How can you use it if you don't memorize it? In other words, poetry is so beautiful, you remember it, and when you need it, you think back on. Unlike the precepts of philosophy that are abstract and we forget them, poetry is something we remember. Uh, just think about preachers. Almost all preachers, if they want to incite goodness in their parishioners, they tell stories because we remember stories. They're embodied in a kind of a flesh and we remember them. Again, uh, along with this idea of the concrete universal, Sidney reminds us again that historians are bound to recount a particular event just as it is, even if that event debases virtue and encourages vice. Again, history's got to stick to quote the facts. And again, as I said, in our world, virtue and vice are so often intermingled that the historian, without wanting to, may end up encouraging vice because he tells us the way things are. The poet again, is free to alter the particular so as to embody more fully the universal that is sought. Poetry is allowed to change things and make them new and so give us a perfect example of vice or virtue. Now for Sidney, the perfect example of this is the parable of the ewe lamb that Nathan the prophet used to convict David of his sin. Many of you will remember that King David committed that sin where he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah put to death. Many of you know that. Now, Nathan is a prophet and Nathan's job is to come up and convict David of his sin. But how is Nathan going to do it? God tells him, go do it. If he comes up and says, King, you're an, adulteress and a, an adulterer and a murderer, David may get mad and kill him. So what does Nathan do? He tells a story. He goes up and he says, Oh, King David, I have a case for you. I want judgment. Here's the case. There's a rich man and a poor man. The rich man has countless flocks and sheep and cattle. The poor man has only one little ewe lamb. And he loved that ewe lamb. He fed it milk from a bottle. He slept with it. He loved it. One day, a stranger came through the town and went to the home of the rich man and asked for dinner. But the rich man, rather than killing one of his multitudinous flocks and serving it to a stranger, took the ewe lamb from the poor man, killed it, and served it to dinner. And Nathan says, O king, O lord, what should the judgment be? And David immediately jumps up in anger and says, That rich man should be killed. He had no pity. And Nathan turns on him and says, Sire, you are that man. Remember this if you ever need to teach somebody. It's a way to do it because what happens is that Nathan, I'm sorry, David accepts the story and once he accepts the story, he's got to accept the truth that comes with it. I suppose we can say Nathan tricks him, but he does it for a higher reason. Again, he's very smart. Nathan the prophet is in many ways a poet. All right, I have given you the four defenses Sidney gives in favor of poetry. But since he's writing a systematic rhetorical defense, in addition to defense, he must also do what's called rebuttal. As you all know, in rhetoric, there, you know, in, in a debate team, there's a point where you've got to answer the criticism of your opponent. And so Sidney, being very systematic, does that. He now goes on to give us four arguments made against poetry, and he rebuts or answers those arguments. All right, the first argument against poetry that he's going to rebut is the old-fashioned one that poetry is unprofitable. There are many better ways to spend our time. And as I mentioned to you in the first lecture, this is something that's not only leveled against poetry, it's leveled against the humanities in general. Oh, they're useless, we don't need them, they're unprofitable. What is Sidney's answer to that? Sidney's answer is, wait a minute, poetry is not unprofitable, actually it is the most fruitful of all knowledge. Why? Because it has the power through teaching and pleasing to move its hearer to virtuous action. And what did we just see earlier? Poetry does that better than either history or philosophy. And again, if poetry is the best vehicle for encouraging virtue and getting away from vice, 
then it is very, very profitable, especially if it does it better than philosophy. I mean, if we're going to run a, a society that works, we've got to have people that yearn for virtue and want to f uh, forsake vice. Well, poetry has that effect, and it does it more effectively and efficiently than anybody else, so poetry is profitable. Number two, the second argument against poetry is that poetry is the mother of lies. And we still hear that today. Oh, poetry is all lies, okay? We even hear, sometimes real, real conservative people, they don't want to teach their kids about Santa Claus because they think it will confuse them, right? I mean, to me, that's kind of crazy. But again, this idea that, that, you know, if we tell stories to our kids, they'll grow up and think, oh, mom and dad lied to me. Oh, no, all right? First of all, the way Sidney answers this is he says, no, no, poets never lie because they never claim that their poems are the truth. The way he puts it is, uh, poems never lieth because they never affirmeth. They never claim to be the truth. They claim to be poetry. They claim to be a fiction, although a higher fiction that has meaning. But again, poets never claim that what they're saying is truth in the sense of history being truth. In fact, he says, poetry is like the stage. The stage offers an illusion, an account of what should or should not be, not what is or isn't. And Sidney says, only fools confuse illusions with reality, right? Even children know. I've got a little boy who's four named Alex, and he tells me about his imaginary friend, but every so often he'll say, of course, I'm just using my imagination, Daddy. I mean, even he, under five years old, knows the difference between illusion and reality. Sidney's saying, come on, we're not fools. We know that when we go to a play, we know that's an illusion on the stage. Well, we know that with poetry, too, so don't say poetry lies. It, a lie is when you claim something is the truth that isn't. That's a lie. Poetry never does that. Poetry never affirms or claims to be the truth. Notice here, we're seeing that tactic I've spoken of before, where you create a separate sphere for poetry. Poetry is different than philosophy. Again, that's a, another way of handling Plato, if you remember. All right, the third criticism is that poetry entices and leads to sinful behavior. Have you ever heard people say that? A lot of people say that about the stage, particularly. Oh, that's going to make people commit sins. We don't, we don't need this poetry. And a lot of times people that want to censor things that kids read in school are afraid that it will lead them to some kind of sin. I really like Sidney's answer to this. And if you're ever on a board trying to, to, to go against censorship in the school, remember what Sidney says. It's very simple. He says, it is not, I'm sorry, it is not poetry itself, but the abuse of poetry that leads to sin. Like most things in our world, poetry is neutral. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And just because some people take poetry and use it for evil, doesn't mean that poetry itself is evil. Indeed, Sidney says, if we are to accept the argument that poetry leads to sin and must be thrown out, then you know what? We have also got to throw out the Bible. For the Bible has often been perverted into a source for heresy and sin. I mean, of all books, I bet the Bible has been used for more sin than any other book. People distort it for, for cults and heresies and all the terrible things people do. Does that mean we should stop reading the Bible? Actually, there was one point in history when the church outlawed the Bible. It was kind of funny because they were afraid. But, you know, Sidney's point is, is a, is a well-taken well one here. Again, it is not poetry itself, but the abuse of poetry that leads to sin. So the right thing to do is make a right use of poetry, not throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we say today. Finally, Plato kicked out the poets from the Republic. How do we answer that? And you know what Sidney says? Sidney says, for him, this argument is the hardest one to answer because he says that he honors Plato above all people. Sidney says, I love Plato. He's formed so much of my thought, and I hate to have to contradict him, but I have to because if I'm going to defend poetry, I've got to defend that attack that Plato kicked them out of the Republic. Well, here's his answer. First of all, he reminds us again that it was the poets who taught and guided the philosophers. Poets came first, philosophers came second. And you know what he realizes? Just like Longinus, Sidney discovers in Plato's attack on poetry, he discovers again what we called an anxiety of influence between Plato and Homer, the need to kill off your predecessor. And he reminds us, and it's true, that seven cities strove for the honor of being Homer's birthplace while the city of Athens voted to banish Socrates. All right, nobody knows exactly where Homer 
lived. He's almost surely from what we call the Asia Minor coast, modern Turkey today. And there were seven cities and islands all along Asia Minor that all fought to say, we are the birthplace of Homer. That's how much everybody loves Homer, loves the poet. They all are fighting to say, no, he belongs to me, no, he belongs to me, no, he belongs to me. Think about what happened to Socrates. You all know the story. Socrates was brought to trial, and really what they wanted to do is banish him. But Socrates refused, and so they forced him to drink the hemlock and die. And we must remember that Plato witnessed the death of Socrates. We know that he was horribly uh, moved and, and, and disappointed and crushed having to watch his, 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 his friend, his mentor, his everything die. In fact, he memorialized Socrates in the great apology to try to capture the essence of him. So there's a real anxiety of influence here. Philosophers are thrown out, and a lot of cities threw philosophers out. But everybody loves poets. It's an anxiety of influence. Another uh, uh, answer to Plato, I didn't really talk about this in lecture two, but one of Plato's critiques of poetry, the central critique, is that <clears throat> poets like Homer were the origins of scandalous stories about the gods. Most of you are familiar with Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. All those stories about gods you know, committing adultery and doing nasty, peevish things. Well, Plato said, we can't have our guardians being taught these scandalous stories about the gods, so throw poetry out. Well, Sidney's answer to that, and to me it's a little bit contrived, but he says, hey, Homer didn't invent those stories about the gods, he just imitated them. Maybe that's a little contrived, but that's also an answer to Plato. Finally, and here is where Sidney brings in the Christian uh, point of view that I spoke about early in this lecture. He reminds us that St. Paul in Acts chapter 17 affirms that it was the pagan poets rather than the philosophers who came closest to foreseeing the truths of Christ. Now this takes a little explanation here. In Acts chapter 17, many of you will recognize this as I tell you the story, Paul is journeying through Athens, and he noticed that there are idols all over the city of Athens to all sorts of gods, and it really upset, upset him to see all this idolatry. And he noticed with a little humor that one of the idols said to an unknown god, like the tomb of the unknown soldier, and so what Paul did is he went up to the Areopagus, where all the wise men of Athens met, and he spoke to them. And he said, Oh, you wise men of Athens, I notice that you worship an unknown God. Now, I'm going to proclaim to you who that God is. You don't know him, but I'm going to proclaim him to you. He is Christ. And what he says, and I love this, Paul says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In other words, as St. Paul defends Christianity and the truths of Christ before a pagan audience. He actually quotes pagan poetry. And three times in the epistles of Paul, he quotes pagan poetry to back up Christianity. He doesn't quote pagan philosophers. He quotes the pagan poets. And again, what Sidney does with this, he says, wait a minute. It is the poets who come closer to the Christian revelation than the philosophers. And uh, an example I would give, he doesn't give this one, but the best example would be Virgil. Uh, Virgil lived and died before Christ, shortly before Christ, so he couldn't have known about Christianity. But many people in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance considered Virgil to be a proto-Christian. Because there's so much in the Aeneid. And Aeneas is almost described as a Christian hero. All the virtues Aeneas must learn are the virtues that St. Paul himself must learn as he becomes, you know, quote, super Christian. And there's a story in, uh, many of you know that Dante, a Christian poet, chose Virgil as his guide through the inferno. Now, why choose a pagan poet as your guide through a Christian world? Well, it's because people saw Virgil as someone who prepared the way for Christianity. Again, uh, I can go into that more, but basically the idea here is that it was in their poetry that the pagans came closest to an understanding of the incarnate God. And the Sydney makes much of that. Uh, finally, to finish up this defense, he reminds us again that Plato says poets speak by divine inspiration. Well, again, maybe we should listen to them. Finally, Sidney concludes his essay by putting a curse on all poet haters. He says, may they never win love for want of a sonnet, and may they be forgotten for want of an epitaph. And there's that neoclassical wit I talked about, the power of poetry. If you don't have poetry, you're never going to win love, and no one's going to remember you because you won't have an epitaph. And so, again, in a very serious essay, Sidney ends on a sort of witty comic end, and that's very, very neoclassical.